My name is R. Crosby Lyles and this is News from the Can. This is the Atlantic Hurricane Force Storms, Identifying Stratospheric Air Intrusions and Effects of Hurricane Force Wind Events on Iceberg Limit. Why am I looking at this? Looking at this because of this. Art Bell and Whitley Strieber, Today Show Interview 2000. Anyone who has seen my video, The Armageddon Line, will know that basically The Armageddon Line was a restatement of or more ideas about uh, the book that these guys wrote, The Coming Global Superstorm. I'd like to direct anyone who has left any comments on my video, The Armageddon Line, that were negative about Art Bell. I would like to point you to this video so that you can see that Art Bell and Whitley Strieber are totally reasonable people. They're not crazy. They went to write a book that was basically a fictionalized account. They did some research and they were compelled by what they found. And what they found, among other things, is woolly mammoths had been frozen in place with green vegetation still in their mouths. That's a compelling piece of information that basically says that they were in a warm climate area above the Arctic Circle and were frozen in place. Meaning that there was a sudden change in the climate, a sudden climatological change that went from warm to cold. That's a perfectly reasonable analysis. Whenever I play my video, the Armageddon line for anyone on my phone, I see their eyebrows raise up when they hear that a result of global warming is that as the troposphere warms up, the stratosphere cools down dramatically. And this creates an imbalance, which gives you a store of potential energy on a global scale that's perfectly reasonable for someone to assume that, that that could build up to the point where there's a sudden release of that potential energy. The fluid mechanics of the stratosphere are different than the fluid mechanics of the troposphere. Basically, there is no convection in the stratosphere. It has to do with the distance that the air molecules are apart from each other. So, the statistical mechanics are different. The air in the stratosphere is much less dense than in the troposphere. So anyway, this leads people to believe, because the stratosphere, because the, the fluid mechanics are a little bit different than in the stratosphere than they are in the troposphere, that this that's impossible for the air of the stratosphere to suddenly dive down. That's a big, that's something, that's a comment that I've seen over and over again, that for the troposphere and the stratosphere to just trade places it seems implausible to some people. And it seemed implausible to me for a while. I, I, you know, knowing what I know about fluid mechanics, that does seem like a stretch. So that's a sticking point. However, woolly mammoths were found with green vegetation still in, in their mouths, and there's this. This is the geologic record. Before every glacial period, there was a period of advanced global warming that's a spike that's almost like a straight vertical line that goes up from the coldest point to the warmest point. And then there's a quick turnaround. And this happens repeatedly. Period of global warming that's actually fairly short-lived. And then spike and drop. You can see the geologic record basically bears out Art Bell and Whitley Strieber's narrative. And what this looks like is it looks like a methane pulse to me. That there's a pulse of, of perhaps a clath rate release from a volcanic eruption or some sort of other, you know, maybe there's a big freeze down to the equator that, and then there's a release of carbon dioxide and methane or whatever. At some point in this vertical drive, you can imagine that there's going to be methane released at least from melting permafrost. And then it reaches a maximum, and then it turns around. And what I've suggested in my video, methane off switch to global warming, is that the methane crosses the tropopause into the stratosphere, reacts with ozone in the upper stratosphere, which produces water vapor, uh, which can coalesce into ice crystals, and CO2, the CO2 falls out because the CO2 has a molecular weight of like 46 or 48, something like that, and the water has a molecular weight of 18, I believe, and methane has a molecular weight of like 16. So, very similar weight. Water has a very similar 
molecular weight is methane. So water vapor gets easily deposited into the upper stratosphere, and that's how it's done. I mean, this is pretty much known. There's been, there is refutation out there about whether water vapor actually produces any cooling effect, because apparently other people have been talking about this for a long time. There's some, a paper that was, le re was released in 2001 that refutes that whole thing, what I just said, because there supposedly there was, I'd seen reports there, were, there was a methane release in 2013 which, that was followed by the Pacific Blob Anomaly, which went from 2013 to 2016, which is which a persistent patch of warm water in the Pacific Ocean, right off the Pacific Northwest, and this is British Columbia here. And that lasted until 2016, in which case, right after that, and of course, there was a big drought here on the, the West Coast. And then, of course, that turned into massive floods, and it got cooler. And now we're in a cooling trend, which would suggest that perhaps there was a big methane release. There was a clathrate release. The blob was while that methane is, you know, because that methane will react with the air, and then you'll have extra carbon dioxide or whatever, that that pulse would cause a brief period of advanced global warming and then it crosses the tropopause into the stratosphere and uh, produces the, your water vapor and then you start seeing the, the, the turnaround to cooling which is where we are now in 2017 with massive amounts of snowfall so I'm looking for I'm trying to find water vapor and, and methane imagery from the stratosphere and I'm having trouble finding current data, frankly. And then I ran across this. Atlantic hurricane force storms identifying stratospheric air intrusions. Well, that's an interesting term there. Stratospheric air intrusions. And then when you read the introduction here, keeping Art Bell and Whitley Strieber in mind, during the winter and early spring months, rapidly intensifying hurricane force storms are common in the North Atlantic Ocean. On average, there are approximately 45 hurricane force storms per season in the North Atlantic. The National Weather Service's Ocean Prediction Center, OPC, is responsible for providing accurate and timely warnings and forecasts, which help prevent loss of life and property at sea, since gathering data over the ocean is challenging due to the lack of observations, satellite imagery is an important and necessary forecast tool. Improving the lead time of hazardous weather conditions is crucial to many maritime industries. Therefore, identifying the probable signs of explosive cyclogenesis early on is a vital goal. Explosive cyclogenesis. Hmm. Identifying stratospheric air intrusions, which could lead to hurricane force wind events and explosive cyclogenesis. Gee, that sounds kind of sort of like what these guys were talking about. So, gee whiz, I don't know what to tell you guys. You know, Art Bell did his radio show, Coast to Coast, on AM radio for decades. And um, I don't know how long he did it for, but he did it for a long time. And the range of comments that I get on the Armageddon Line video about Art Bell, as soon as they see the, the name Art Bell, well, you just lost all credibility there. Well, okay. If you can't listen to something because of the messenger, I don't know what to tell you. But the data that they provided is is true. So I'm going to look at the data, not, you know what I mean? And when you watch these guys on this video, they seem totally reasonable to me. And some people, I've noticed, um, some of their comments are like they have seem to have some sort of resentment against Art Bell. Because maybe they called into his show and maybe he wasn't nice to him or something. I don't know. They seem totally reasonable to me. And they seem totally reasonable in the book, the, Cl the coming global superstorm. It just, you know, it's it's a pretty even keel read, really, frankly. So, you know, anybody out there who's got a hard on against Art Bell for whatever reason, man, I really don't know what to tell you. 
but just because it's Art Bell, you're not going to, you know what I mean? You're not going to look at, at, at the preponderance of evidence. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't even know what to say about that. That's the absurd. And the reason that this is important now is because with the Pacific Blob, we went through this period where people were talking about, you know, the extinction of mankind within nine years and stuff like that because they were, they were concerned that the Earth was just going to fry from global warming. Meanwhile, this has been out there. You know, these guys wrote this book back in 1998, 99, and then we just forgot about it, um, that this was a possibility. But it's right there in the geologic record. I mean, there it is. So if somebody out there has got another idea about what it ought to be, you know, any better ideas, you know, the Guy McPherson people, they thought that the spike was going to go up to the BETM level, which might be possible, but I think that there's, there's issues with uh, sulfides, sulfates, and so forth with that. But anyway, that's all I wanted to... That, that's the, the thrust of this video, the two things. I just want to direct people to this video and to this piece of research here, which is pretty compelling. So this is where, you know, this is where we are with the amount of heat trapped by the oceans at this point and the grand solar minimum coming upon us and stuff. One should always be prepared for um, sudden changes in the weather. You know, you want to make sure to have some sort of survival equipment on you at all times, meaning, you know, uh, like a, a cop whistle to signal with. It's a nice thing to have. You can wear it around your neck. Flashlight, little flashlight. You know, there's a lot of, you know, protein bars, some water, you know, just basic survival stuff. You know, if you're driving around or whatever, I, I say that every time. Anyway, um, that's all I got for this time. My name is R. Crosby Lyles, and this has been News from the Can. Thanks for watching. See you.